Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be. I am sitting here with the renowned and famous and accomplished Miss Emily Tyner. Um, and she is going to share with us some of the tips that she has learned growing up uh, with the mother who experienced different types of, um, how do we say it, Emily, uh, dangerous situations or as economic societal shutdowns where people needed to take precautions to make sure that they were prepped, prepared to kind of make it through. Um, and I figured that given where we are with this COVID-19 and dealing with these things, that some of these tips could be phenomenal for your families, your loved ones, your friends that you may know. Um, I was impressed with some of the stuff, so I made her stop. And I was like, don't tell me anything else. I want to write this down. I want to capture it. I want to share with the world. So hopefully this is helpful to you. And uh, Emily, welcome. Thank you for spending some time with me. Of course. Thank you very much for having me. So how did you become, an, how did your mom become an expert? You say your mom taught you a lot of this stuff. How, well, tell me about, tell, tell me, tell us about your mama. Who's, who's this phenomenal lady? Okay. So um, the background on uh, my family is that they are, um, Belizean immigrants. Okay. Um, I'm a first generation American. Nice. And um, I'll say that her experience and her um, her lessons to me that are sort of now ingrained in how I behave and how I act, um, specifically in natural disasters um, and impending natural disasters and what we have right now, which is a little bit more than a natural disaster, I would say. Yeah. Um, all stems from her experience um, in 1961 when she was uh, part of a Category 5 hurricane in Belize, Central America. And just a little bit of history on the country. Right now, the population is about 350,000, but in 1961, it wasn't even a percentage of that. Oh, wow. So um, a Category 5 hitting the city, a uh, direct hit was devastating it was devastating and they actually it used to be the capital and they actually had to move the capital inland because of this devastating hurricane so, so wait wait what, what is a category five what does that even mean category five hurricane um it talks about wind speed it talks about the um the intensity of the rain how long it's going to be how long it's going to be um over the land Okay. Okay. Um, but mostly the most of they're talking about wind and power and size, also the size of the hurricane. Wow. Okay. Five. Gotcha. So this was a category five. You said it was 150,000 people there in the city? Around in the, in the city. No, that's in the entire country. So in the city, oh, right wow. now, there's 350,000 people in the entire country. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Right. right. Very small okay. country, rare, a rare breed. Mm -hmm. Um. The back then in the city, they there was probably less than ten thousand people in the city at that point in time. For sure. so, so your mom is there, her her relatives, her friends. Um, there's this big, huge category five disaster that's coming straight towards them. And first of all, how old was mom back during this time? Mom was eight years old. Eight years old. So she's a little girl living through this. Mm -hmm. And what was her experience? Did she tell you about how it was for her back then? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's something that, um, I don't want to say it traumatized her, um, but that was because of the preparedness of my grandmother, who was in charge of the family at that point in oh, time. Wow, wow. Um, but it definitely affected her in a way that has proved um, very helpful, specifically in quarantine time, and me preparing for taking care of her and other grandparents and things like that during quarantine, for sure. Gotcha. So your grandmother probably had lived through this herself a time or two at the by this point. That my that was that's my great grandmother. My grandmother, her mother was living in the states. She um, came to the states that time to send money back to sort of help out with the family. So it was just my great-grandmother and my mother. And my great-grandmother had lived oh, oh. through a hurricane that was the deadliest hurricane ever in Belize in 1931. Oh, and had goodness. already prepared, like had already known what to prepare and how to prepare for that time. Gotcha. So we have a great-grandmother who lived through one of the deadliest ones in 1931, who grew up her daughter, your grandmother, mm -hmm. right? Grandmother grows up, grandma goes to America. Mm -hmm. 
but before she goes to America, she has your mom. Mm -hmm. Your mom is growing up in Belize. Your grandma is here in the States sending money back. So we have, and before, by the time we get to you, we have four generations of Belizean women who have taught and shared and passed down these tips for making it through disaster type situations. Kind of maybe similar to what we may or may not experience, but I guess these things could fit the bill no matter what it is that we're living through. Well, I think it's I think it's it's a, a baseline of readiness specifically because back then and now it's considered third world country. So if you're getting third world prepared, you'll absolutely be first world prepared. Wow. Well, let's jump into it. I love that. I love that. Uh, as an aside, I always have a problem with the the term third world. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. Because it has a, it always has this baggage of different things that have nothing to do with it intelligence levels and mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff and, and I think that that's such a if I just get on my high horse real quick that's such a sheltered arrogant if I may mm -hmm. Americanized if not western westernized view but at least I can speak for American society and right. uh, we got to do better I haven't traveled a little bit in my adult life and gotten to meet so many phenomenal people um I'm like man we, we don't even have a clue. So anyway, I hear what you're saying. And at the base level, these tips probably could work for anybody, regardless of socioeconomic level, exactly. where they are in the country or in the world. Yeah, exactly. Let's jump into it. So Emily gave me a list, you guys, of things that her mom, with, with, your mom is Miss Audrey? Yes. Audrey gotcha. Gillette. Mm -hmm. Audrey Gillette. So Miss Audrey Gillette has this list of seven I, I, okay, so the type you got to help me with the title. The title is Audrey's Attic Hurricane Tips. What's the attic about? Because um, people keep memories, traumas, feelings, all that type of thing in the attic. So mm -hmm. this is her experience. This is her attic <clears throat> information. Like if you go up in the attic and you shuffle around, that's what I did. I shuffled around my mom's attic. Wow. Um, and in life and then, you know, for this list. And this is what I've come up with. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So I'm going to read through this list for you guys real quick. And then we're going to go through it and break them down. And then we're going to recap them and get on out of here. Right? So hopefully th these things are helpful to you for your folks and for yourself. All right. So there are seven of these. Audrey's Attic Hurricane Tips. Number one, the pre-plan. I don't really know what that is. I'm going to learn too. I got my pen. I got some notepaper here. The second thing, fresh water collection and storage. Uh, the third thing, communication, a battery oper operated radio and extra batteries. I don't even have that. I hate to say that. Need to get better. Number four, food, small, complete, and satisfying. I wonder what your mom meant by that. Em. I would love to get into that. Uh, number five, travel. Be prepared with supplies for 10 days. What kind of Supplies are helpful for travel, um, besides the take of gas. I don't know. Uh, oh, number six, a warm blanket. And number seven, a memento game activity book. I guess that's just not to go stir crazy uh, when everything's shut down, I'm guessing. I don't know. Uh, so with that being said, did I get them all, Emily? Is you did, okay? yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Feel free to take it away. Number one, what is the pre-plan? Okay, so the pre-plan, just like writing a um, template for anything you know uh -huh. when you're when you're when you're um like a brainstorming session anything like that the pre-plan uh -huh. is the most important step specifically for natural disasters because they can be so unpredictable okay so the things that you're thinking about in your pre-plan is where you're going to hunker down where are you going to where's going to be safe okay and how long it's going to take you to get there, how many people are going to be there with you to take those type of statistics. What's everybody's health, you know, what's everybody's sort of health status. Also physically, who, you know, are, are, is everybody elderly, you know, take uh, ages, that type of thing. And also a backup to the backup to the backup to the backup to the backup. That belongs in a pre-plan stage. So for instance, um, I live in New York. I've lived in New York for the past 14 years. Um, I found out about this virus in January. That's when I started my pre-plan, getting supplies long before, long before it was like, oh, everybody get your this, get your that, that when you, as soon as you have a feeling that something might happen, because best case scenario, nothing happens. But worst case scenario, you aren't in a long line, getting sick, 
you know, have the, the, um, the possibility for violence, you know, that type of thing. Um, all of that is part of the plea plan. So my pre plan was to, okay, I know that I'm going to have to clean out my apartment, make sure that I'm eating all of the perishable groceries because I don't know when I'm going back home. And that is very real now. You don't, people who are quarantined outside of their homes don't know when they're going back. They think they know when they go back, but if the government decides for our safety or for other reasons that they don't want any cars on the street, no travel, you know, the guards are, the guards are making sure that everybody stays inside, you can't get back home. And you may have somebody that's close to your home or something like that. So clearing your space. So, okay, go to my house on the third shelf, in the top drawer, there's a key to the safe that has this type of stuff. My records are in a lockbox that is waterproof, fireproof, those type of things. That belongs in your free plan. The all of your you should be putting all of your most important documents, your birth certificates, your social security card. That type of stuff needs to be safe because if for one reason or another, you know, they there's computer hackers and internet hackers and things like that, where there's no proof of who you are. The only thing you have to say who you are, are your original documents. Wow. And that's part of the pre-plan. I'm gonna ask you a question where, given a situation like this, right? Hurricane, everything maybe is underwater or knocked out. Um, whatever we're dealing with, with this COVID-19 potential society economic shutdown, Mm -hmm. Where are some places that people can go? Um, because if everybody's kind of dealing with the same thing, where is there to go? In, in your the, the, the safest place to go is where there aren't a lot of other people. And that's not, that's sort of, it's sort of um, lofty to think about because some people don't have the ability to go where there isn't a lot of other people. But the safest place to be is not where there is going to be a struggle for resources. It mm. really is the safest, you know, the safest place. So, so what, do you, what do you mean by that? Like out in the wilderness, in the woods somewhere, like in a forest or a Exactly. And that's why, you know, that's why one, um, you know, that depends on the, that depends on the natural disaster because the last place you want to be is an open field, you know, when there's like a lightning storm because you're yeah. going to get hit. Right, right, but right. Um, for the most part, yes. And when you think about, um, when you think about people who built these like um, end of world bunkers and things like that, it's always in the middle of the woods because of security. And that's something that hasn't quite escalated yet during the quarantine time, but I promise you it definitely will because people are going to get desperate and people are going to get scared and being away from people um, allows you to be able to manage the safety and security of of where you are, the barrier. You can see people coming from every angle. It's like having cameras all around your house. If, if there's no blind spots, then that's when you're the safest. And the, the best way to to stay away from blind spots is to stay away from that, is to stay away from, you know, stay away from other people, really. Oh stay out of populous environments, i.e. New York, which is a hot zone right now. Yeah, because it's so densely populated. Mm -hmm. Wow, so... I actually was kind of running through my family and I was trying to figure out who should do what. And, and Alex, so I'm just kind of taking notes. Um, I hate to say this. Uh, this I knew that when, when you first mentioned this to me, I knew it was something that would be helpful for people, which is why I asked, would you be willing to share? Right. Um, as necessary as this is, I don't like it. I don't like the conversation, right? But I, I equivocated to maybe like your wisdom teeth coming in or the soreness of running a marathon or getting in shape or something like that. Like, yeah, it's uncomfortable, right? Yeah, it makes you fatigued and all that kind of stuff. But the, the outcomes of going through that process is so much more worth it than kind of just sitting where you are. So talking to you, I thought it was gonna be a lot more fun and lighthearted and well later down in the list it gets fun and lighthearted but not the pre-plan pre-plan yeah, is about the yeah. 
what I'm realizing is that your mom didn't, and your grandmom and your great grandmom, they didn't live through a light splashing of their homelands. Um, in order to come up with this sort of stuff, they live through some serious things. And the fact that we even need to have this conversation to share kind of really is a, is a signal of the times that we are living in a position where we could be living through something very similar. And that's tough to face. You know what I mean? That's that's not fun, but it's, it's very necessary. Thank you for the workout. I'm already feeling like, oh my gosh. And we're going to number one. So uh, let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. That was number one. Let me get my, I know you know it, but I just want to say it out loud. So fresh water collection and storage. Storing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Fresh water collection and storage um, is paramount because when all else fails you're out of food you're out of um your you know you're you're out of everything yeah. that the only thing that is going to help you survive from one day to the next is fresh water okay. and that is across cultures that is across socioeconomic statuses everything if you're living in a hut if you're living in a mansion if you don't have fresh water it doesn't matter and fresh water storage is important, um, I'm gonna say in all natural disasters, because okay. you never know what's going to happen and the water is going to get tainted. Mm. So you need to think about where it's going to store. And the best way to do it, you know, people are used to going to the store and getting plastic bottles and stuff like that. You may not have the money to do that. You may not have the um, transportation to go do that. And the best, thing to do that most like you already have are take um uh to take pots pans um pitchers anything like that and fill them with water fill your bathtub with water fill the sink with water all of those things because you can spoon out a little bit at a time if you if the water stops running in your building or you don't have running water then that will help you flush um flush the toilet or uh, clean out um, a chamber pot or something like that um, for sewage. Um, so, mm -hmm, go ahead. So, wow, water doesn't get much more basic and vital than that, right? When in the world do you, what are the signals passed down from generation to generation in your experience that we should look for the signs, the symptoms that we should be paying attention to that says now is the time to fill up the bathtub with water for us to be able to drink and or flush the toilet with given everything. Like, like, are there anything, I know we can't predict the future, but are there any writings on the wall, so to speak, that would help us be aware of that? Absolutely. Any time where there is a chance of the power going out, so any sort of any sort of storm, a tsunami, uh, a hurricane, a tornado, any of those types of things where you feel like or tornadoes tough because a lot of times that changes very quickly, but anything where there is a chance that the power will go out, that's when you need to start thinking about water storage, boiling your water. Make sure that it's clean water and then storing it in places because the worst again that it's scary to think about but the worst thing that happens is you drink the water you cook with it you take a bath you know whatever storing it isn't going to affect you but not having water could potentially kill you wow wow once again you are making this more real than my little secret <laughs> Is prepared for. There's later in the thing, it'd be funny. <laughs> These are great tips. I'm over here like, yeah, make sure you stay in touch with friends and family. Yeah. Make sure you have water. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, let me just make a note to self about buying some water. A few gallons. Mm -hmm. The crazy thing about water, I remember when, so... For those of you that may have lived through this, um, you guys remember 1998, right? And as we got into 1999, the talk was about Y2K. Uh -huh. So many of us thought 
that it was going to be a complete global economic shutdown because no computer system was prepared for the 199 rollover. Um, and we thought that we were going to kind of get reverted back to the stone age, right? People just right. scrapped for their lives. And so in preparation for that, when I was, uh, I was a teenager back then, so dating myself, right? I'm still a teenager. No, but dating myself, uh, they, we used to buy gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of water. And I learned something that I've kept with me for the rest of my life, unopened plastic gallons of water have a date on them mm -hmm. that if you don't use them they expire they go stale they get whatever it is that happens to unopen it's not like canned goods that could just last and last and last mm -hmm. these things have a definite um, expiration date and so for a long time after then we so we ended up having to throw out and get rid of so much water because we didn't pay attention to the dates for years so maybe somewhere around like 2002 2004 we got all of this store i mean a shed full of shed fulls of water that expired two three years ago and so it's like Ugh, we got to get rid of it so i've always been kind of antsy about just buying gallons of water and keeping it but there has to be a middle ground um, and I think that I would rather have it and just go through the process of re-upping and getting rid of maybe putting it in the in the in the plants or something like that. I don't know. Maybe taking a bath with it. You can still take a bath with water like that, I guess. Right, but any water, any liquid that is um, kept in plastic yeah. has an expiration date because it starts to eat through the plastic. So your the toxicity levels rise. Yeah. So that's the issue with the. That's why. Um, Audrey's attic suggestion is boil your own water and then mm. keep it in your keep it in your things. Oh my goodness, guys! Did y'all think this was gonna be fun? No, it just it isn't. Okay, um, love it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Number three, communication: a battery-operated radio and extra batteries. All right. There's one thing in that list about communication. Um, that is part of communication, but I didn't write it down. Okay. So battery operated again, because we live in a world where people rely on their cell phones, rely on their laptops. If there's no power, then all of those devices, which we found out very well in anybody who was affected by Hurricane Sandy, that York, if you don't have any, say that again? Up in New York, that area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In New yeah, York, yeah. There, was, yeah. there was a blackout for a week in New York. Oh my goodness, an right. entire week with no electricity? An entire week in Manhattan with no electricity. Wow. A week. I don't consider myself dainty at all. I literally felt like this, like, like oh, I literally just had like, oh, a, oh, my, like pearl, like, oh my goodness. Wow, an entire week without, not for Facebook, right? Not, not for that, but the number of things that we rely on for simple electricity, Anyway, keep going. Wow. All right. So what, what should we be paying attention to? Battery operator radio, because you are going to need instructions mm. about what's going on. You need to know if there's shelters, where they are. If there's, you know, the National Guard being deployed, you need to know what they are and what the new, just like how we are experiencing now curfews that are happening at four o'clock, they say a curfew and it starts 8 p.m. If you don't have any communication, then you don't know that, then you run the risk, specifically in the black and brown communities of now being a target. Oh my goodness. So um, okay. that's that's really important uh, to have that type of communication. Also letting people know, it goes back to your pre-plan, letting people know what your plans are, where you're gonna go, who you're gonna be with, you know, what sort of, what sort of um, things you have stored, um, all of that's really important because communities are important. Yeah. And um, that's part of, you know, being connected to the community and, um, you know, taking care of yourself, like taking care of yourself, being prepared, basic preparedness. Wow. Uh, wow. What I forgot to say about the communication is a light. That's another way. If everything goes dark, you need to have a light. Then you can't rely on your cell phone light if your cell phone won't charge. And if there's batteries or something like that and you run out of batteries, 
then your flashlight doesn't work either. So the, you know, the next step down is a candle, but then you need a candle and fire. If it's raining, if it's windy, that type of stuff, then what are you gonna do? What's the next step? The answer are glow sticks. Glow sticks. <laughs> Nobody thinks about glow sticks, but they're so, so, so important because they can't be damaged by water. They don't need to be charged. And if something happens, something collapses on you or something like that, you have a glow stick that at least gives time for people to see where you are. And oh my help. gosh. I, I promise you, man, that is so simple and it, and it blew my mind. It can't be damaged by water. What if I don't have matches? What if the matches I had are wet? wet right? You know, like uh, any of those things, my lighter, my this, my that, but glow sticks in that go bag. They need oh, nothing. In my go bag. Mm -hmm. Um... I'm uncomfortable, and I've, I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna keep saying. Part of the reason why I'm sharing this is because it's so easy to see people online or in suits or or those sort of things that look like they got it together, right. that look like they just live. And 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 the reason why I'm sharing this is because there may be some people that are feeling this intimately and are scared, right? Yes. Um, some that and some that may not be able to express it. And one mm -hmm. of the loneliest feelings is feeling like you're the only one that's taking something seriously or being right. impacted by it. Um, I know for me, my personality type, I'm very relaxed about a lot of situations. And so a lot of times the pressure or the impact of things doesn't really get to me. So I want to honor when it does, one, to show my humanity. I'm regular people just like all of us. And, right. and I appreciate this moment. And then two, um, a lot of times I come on these videos, Miss Emily, and I share thoughts and tips. I'm a student right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing that my nice little shiny degree from here, I'm a nice little master's such and such and such, ain't prepared me at all to think about putting a goddamn glow stick in a radio with a battery in my bag. It barely taught me how to write a checkbook, you know, write a checkbook, <laughs> a checkbook right? The fancy right. degree. So I am so grateful to your great grandmother, your grandmother, your mom, and to you for the knowledge that has been passed down so that we can share to some of us who get the opportunity to listen. So uh, we send them love and blessings and peace. Yeah. Uh, and this is only number three. So let's run through the next one. Okay. This part okay. is, well, uh, is it exciting? I mean, food is always exciting. I like food. I'm food? a big fan of food. I don't know if I'm ready for this. What is this number four? Uh, food, small, complete, and satisfying. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm all ears. What does that mean? Small, complete, and satisfying means that the food that you have covers the basic needs that you're having. Carbs, which are important. People don't like carbs, but they give you energy and protein. Carbs and protein. If you have your water with you, your carbs and your protein will um, will give you energy and that type of thing. So depending on, this goes back to your pre-plan, what you're doing with your food, um, your food preparation is affected by your pre-plan. So okay. if you are going to um, hike through the Andes, then you need to be taking power bars, pop tarts, you know, um, energy drinks, um, Gatorade, 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 Gatorade. Gatorade is so important. And I'm gonna do a quick shout out to Gatorade right now because it, a lot of times that people, specifically how you're just talking about um, people who are very stoic in life and also they tend to be really good at like, okay, so let's take this step, let's take this step, but there's always an emotional toll. And that comes out in right. a lot of different ways. Right, right. right. So for example, um, one of the stories that my mom shared with me was when my great grandmother has 15 children, 15 children, wow. and then all of their children have children also. Yes. So imagine during a hurricane when you're trying to manage 15 of your kids and then your grandkids and then yourself, the stress. And she was equally a stoic and calm and prepared. But one of my mother's memories of how it affected her is she had to use the bathroom constantly, constantly. And that gets really dangerous. And if you only have access to water at that point, 
then you're not rehydrating quick enough and it's not giving you the energy, i.e. Gatorade refills those electrolytes to give you the energy back and also, you know, rehydrates the body. So um, any the sports drinks, they do have sugar in them, but you need the energy. You need the energy. You really do. So you mentioned, uh, so wow, for, wow. I didn't even think about using the bathroom. So I just, let me just tell you how this is affecting me, just how much this <laughs> conversation, right? A couple of tips ago, we were talking so much about water. I was like, oh Jesus. <laughs> now you're talking about using the bathroom and I'm like, I <laughs> look at you. I gotta, go. <laughs> I gotta go right now. Oh my goodness. So uh, man, I, I, did, I did not know I would be affected by this combo like this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of really like impressed, taken aback, surprised by my own reaction to this. I literally thought this would be like simple tips to run through. This is real stuff in this life or death. And it's good that we can talk about it now and listen to the video and pause and rewind and share with folks. We want to do this now when we have time to process. Yes. Right? Yes. What we don't want to do yes. uh, is have to try to force feed this into our brains, into our psyches, into our, our habits and daily routines when it's too late, right? Um, what is, it's a saying, it begins with P's, it's an alliteration. Proper preparation prevents piss poor performance, right? And so we want to make sure that we prevent piss poor performance by properly preparing. Correct. So I'm, I'm impressed with this. You mentioned carbs and you said pop tarts and granola bars things of that nature mm -hmm. um and then you also said protein protein what are, what are some suggestions of things that we can well stop? for you know um i'll start with vegans because i'm sure they were like protein what are you going to talk about for us nuts legumes um uh you know those types of things trail mixes are excellent raisins are great because they're you know they're a nice complex sugar um also and they're not they don't need to be stored like you can you can keep them dry they don't have to be so things that don't have to be refrigerated don't pack fresh fruit no if it, it sounds good and like oh you know while i'm on this you know i'll be having fresh fruit no you won't you won't be doing that you right. won't it's gonna um, go bad. so Dried, dried fruits. Dried, dried fruit is good. Mm -hmm. Slim um, gems. Also, for people who eat meat, um, jerky is good. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff. Things that are dry and things that don't have to be refrigerated um, are are ideal. They're ideal. Wow, it's satisfying. What could, so so help give us a little bit of humanity here. What is satisfying about this whole thing? What's satisfying about um, those foods? Well, satisfying as far as if you know that you normally have four full meals a day, then satisfying needs to be a replacement of those four meals per day. And um, if you're thinking about like, oh, you know, and when I think about it, I think about what I can carry, you know, people feel differently about when they're getting disaster prepared, but I think about with my experience, what I can physically carry, because if you have to run, you know, something like that, what can you carry on your body? And people have to be realistic about where they are in their strength and where they are in, you know, sort of that type of thing. That's why it's, you know, it's helpful to exercise during this time. So, oh my goodness gracious! It, talk about happens. yeah. Mm -hmm. You're physically you are physically prepared. You right. know prepared. that's part of preparation too, being physically prepared. So thinking about that, like okay, um, you know, I have to, I have to leave or I have to do whatever. Um, I need to take my food with me. I need no less than ten to twelve days worth of food. No less. The 10 to 12 days worth of food. Oh I'm gonna geez. say it again. No less than 10 to 12 days worth of food. And why I'm gonna drive that home is because people should have that on them all ways, every single day. Oh my goodness. In your car, whatever, when you're traveling, when you're traveling, not in your own, you know, whatever, but when you're traveling someplace. All you need to do is look at disaster stories from 
up north when they have a, a, a snowstorm that comes out of nowhere and people get trapped on the interstate for days at a time. What? For days at a time. Five, six days that they don't have any water, there's nothing to eat, you know, that type of thing. Or there's an accident, there's especially during natural disasters, you don't know when wind can come, remove a bridge, you know, knock off the access way. Now you have to take the long way. This is the only way I can to get home. That if you have that, then you're always prepared. You don't have to get ready if you stay ready. That's what the Bible says. Or somebody, Shakespeare, <laughs> somebody, somebody, Constitution, <laughs> one of them said it. So you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. Correct. Have water in your trunk, 10 to 12 days worth of food, satisfied. So when you said satisfied, and I was like, mmm, satisfied. That's not what you was talking about. You were saying it needs to be able to meet your needs, satisfy your needs of eating three times a day. And also the food that you're prepping and needing and all that, you got you got you need to think about all of these things in in the in the context of what can I physically carry? What can I right. pick up and throw? Because if I only have my two legs and I can't carry or throw something in a car or whatever, I still mm -hmm. need to be prepared. Uh, this is stressing me out. I listen, folks, I listen, man. I pride myself on being the coolest cat in the room. I I feel a little bit overwhelmed by the prospect of, can I tell you why I feel overwhelmed? Not literally of living through that stuff, but the gnawing reality that if it happened today, I'm not ready at all. Like exactly. I'm zero percent, zero percent ready. If, it, if, it, if all hell broke loose right now, we got on the radio, CNN, whatever, and it was like the governor declares or whatever is happening, I don't have any ability between now and when that would happen to do maybe a fraction of this stuff. And that's the pressure I feel. I just kind of feel behind the eight ball. I really am Emily gonna take time once we get done and, and just start, from, not out of fear. And let me just say this to, to everybody that's listening, right? This, you we can take this energy, emotional energy, and let it overwhelm and paralyze and up our anxiety and increase our stress level, give us ulcers, increase our headaches, increase our, our um, tension where we're fighting and an an angsty with each other. We could allow that to happen. Or we can use the currency of the emotion to propel, to be like an energy, to be an impetus, to make movements, to prepare, right? to mm -hmm. kind of take the take the precautions. So that's what I want to do. I'm sharing that I feel the same energy. I'm not on top of this. I, 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 I am in it with us. Um, I wish that, you know, I was as prepped mentally as, as our dear Emily is. I am not, <laughs> uh, I, I really am feeling it. But I want to remind us about mind frame, about mm -hmm. mindset. I want to mind us, remind us about being uh, present in the moment so that we can think clearly because no human person can think clearly in times of elevated stress, right? And so just kind of being mindful of that. And if I'm not saying this for anybody else, I'm saying that I guess for me, you know, that listen, take that feeling, great, fine. You can use it for good or you can use it for evil. You can use it right. to stress yourself out and just feel overwhelmed or you can use it as an energy. Now you get plugged in right now you can take it and go so thank you again i'm probably gonna say that like 50 more times because i had no idea how much i personally also needed this mm -hmm. talk okay you ready for next <laughs> i am um All right. oh well i jumped the gun in my last one a little bit because i was saying travel again um 10 to 12 days worth of food supplies so you know i i said that multiple times so let me just really quick um, address the fear that the more you're prepared, the less scared you have to be. And a certain amount of fear is, is good because it keeps you aware of what's yeah. happening, aware yeah. of what's going on. But, you know, if you think about um, people who are afraid of talking in front of large groups, everybody's afraid of different things. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about that because that, that's not one of my fears, but I am afraid of heights. 
And I push myself. I've done rock climbing. I've climbed ruins, that type of thing, which is even thinking about it is sort of paralyzing a little bit the fear mm. of um, of just of falling, of being out of control, you know, of of um, of seeing how but also seeing how vast the world is and how small we are. It brings on a little bit of fear for me. So being prepared, knowing that um, that I know the safety regulations, I know my equipment, I know where exits are, you know, like those type of things make me feel less afraid. Oh and um, that, I feel like that is what arms me not to feel, you know, because there's other things about quarantine that are, um, you know, that creep in, but the basic necessities is not something that I feel like I have to be afraid of. And I'd like to arm other people with that type of thing because we have a whole host of things that we should be thinking about, but your basic necessities, your safety, you know, that type of thing shouldn't really be one of them, if possible. If possible. Oh, wow. That's real. Uh, that's real. Just kind of take an initiative to expose yourself to it in order to not be so tense and afraid of it, right? Um, okay. Okay. Uh, the next one, number five, travel. Be prepared with supplies for 10 days. You kind of touched on this. Keep us going. Um, okay, so that's um, supplies. All right, so let me just talk about really quick what supplies I mean. I mean food. I mean water. I mean your radio. Um, I mean, um, oh, also gas. If you have a car, gas. Put a gas can in the back, those little five-gallon gas cans. You never know where that extra, you know, those extra couple miles are going to take you. And I've been, you know, I travel a lot in lots of different places. And being in Mexico in the middle of the night when there's not a gas station for miles and miles and miles, and just, you know, because you could be afraid then, or you can have a gas can in your trunk then, fill up the gas, and then get to your destination. That you have in your pre plan where people are going to go in your car you have your fresh water you communicate when you get there and you got to snack once you reach you got to do what snack snack, snack. You have a snack once you reach because you have prepared gotcha mm -hmm. wow a snack did you i did it. i say that i don't love this conversation did i say that you did ah, ah. It's kind of, remember Home Alone, y'all? Y'all remember Home Alone? I feel like, ah, that's how I feel. Okay, all right. Number six. He was prepared. You have, you say, what about prepared? He was prepared. Listen, I need, right, little Macaulay Culkin was able to, <laughs> listen, he was a, a genius with that stuff. Um, okay, you have this by itself, and I'm very interested to hear why is this so important. Number six, guys, is a warm blanket. Uh, Miss Emily, please tell us about this. A warm blanket for many different things. Um, I'm going to talk about the emotional side since we've been talking about a lot of logistics. Yeah. Having a blanket that you own, that is yours, that smells like you, that you remember when it was bought, you know, those types of things are a huge comfort in a crisis. And if you think about... Um, I just, you know, I'm just thinking about an experience that one, a warm blanket, but the actual best blanket to have is, um, is an all weather blanket that you can get from like REI or one of the other outdoor stores that is a warm, cold blanket that has reflective, it has a reflective, um, a reflective side that will, you know, that is more temperature controlled. So the blanket can be the reflective side up will keep you warm. It, the sun will heat up the will heat up the blanket or reverse it and then you just need to be covered but if you think about you know um all of the different places that you can end up that if you're ending up in a shelter or you're ending up in a friend's home or you're ending up on the street mm. that you have a blanket or something that is protection and people know that you know that you know most people who like really cold environments when they sleep and stuff like that still have a sheet or something that is covering and there is a basis to that about security and just being comfortable 
and um, present, you know, present in the moment. Present. Yeah, I never thought to bring a blanket. Um, and I didn't even know there was a such thing as an all weather blanket. Like yeah. you just, you just kind of this. I had the same thing with the glow sticks a few tips ago. Like <laughs> sticks, an all weather blanket exists. Okay, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. okay. All right. So um, add this to the list. Wow. Thank you for saying that. Um, I have a friend of mine. Um, I'm going to not use his name because he is one of those. He's a prepper and he's okay. been saying this kind of stuff and living this kind of lifestyle of pre -pre 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 preparing mm -hmm. for like 10 years. Right. And uh, like a little bit has always seemed enough. And he always seemed like he was like, uh, like 70 times more than the little bit of like, Oh, okay. Like, come on, come on. He said so, so much of this stuff that you're sharing, you know what I mean? So, um, and he has military training uh, mm -hmm. and some special forces training. So, uh, your mom and grandma probably were special agents. Uh, in <laughs> just never knew it. Like, they, they help keep me safe. Okay, we are at number seven, guys. And I know this was a rather long video. I hope that the conversation between Emily and I was engaging enough that it helped this go by. Uh, maybe you listened to this while you were driving. Uh, maybe you were just laying in the bed. Maybe you sent this in front of your, your family members. You sent this to some of your friends. Sometimes I have a friend of mine. Um, she's living completely by herself. Uh, and she doesn't have the dependence or the pet. She doesn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes convo like that Emily and I just shared, if you send this sort of stuff to them, sometimes it feels like they're in the room. It feels fun. It feels like I'm a part of something. So is there a Wikipedia page somewhere that lists these things? Sure. Right? Sure. Like I said, my friend has been saying these sorts of things to us, to our group for about 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're sharing anything that is completely novel, but hopefully the way we are sharing it kind of sinks in is that comfort food feel that helps make it real. And if you feel like this is helpful to anybody in your circle, get it for them, right? Let them feel it let them, and let them take the time like you have just, just done to kind of go through the paces, see where they are and get prepared as well. With that being said, number seven, very interesting, Emily, you said a mental game activity or book. How is that a part of Audrey's Attic Hurricane Tips. That is actually, I, I, I don't think I can underestimate or, or um, talk about how it's so, 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 so important. Okay. Because we are humans, mm. we're humans and we need we are very connected to um, different things. And for some people, they're connected to exercise or they're connected to reading or they're connected to figurines or stamp collectors or something like that. Something that makes them feel uniquely themselves. So this memento part is something that you feel like speaks to who you are uniquely. And that can be a lot of different things. And I'll just talk really quick about my experience in my experience because for, for most people, I pray that they don't have to find a memento the way I did, which was during a disaster, like, okay, what was with me? will now forever be something that is, you know, when you, they talk about, um, like, if your house is on fire, what do you run back and get? You get one thing, you're not grabbing your clothes, you right. know, we assume you already have your cell phone, that type of thing. Your cell phone um, categorically doesn't, doesn't make you special. <laughs> People think their cell phone, I don't mean that. Something that is uniquely whoever you are, you know, what that is. And in my, um, in my uh, emergency bag, I have a blanket that I got when I was in Mexico. And as I told you before, 
Um, we're Belizean, so Mexico was a place that we used to go on vacation pretty regularly. And one night, we were um, trying to go back from go back from Mexico back to Belize. And for some reason, I don't know what it was. My mom doesn't know. You know, she can't remember. But for uh -huh. some reason, the borders were closed. Borders were closed. To leave so, Mexico to get to Belize? The borders were closed. Exactly. Oh, wow. Okay. So that even though we have, you know, Belize and passports and legally we can get into Belize and, you know, we have citizenship and that type of thing, we weren't allowed. Even with Belize. your passport? Even with your passport because the border was closed. It could have been... You know, it could have been uh, an array of things that they're doing a drug bust or something like that. But for that time period, we were not allowed to. How old were you? I must have been probably eight or nine at the most. So you're telling me that most of the time that I've known you, you started at eight years old. You've been an international criminal. No, I'm joking. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. All right, so, okay. So eight years old, you started your criminal empire. I'm listening, go. <laughs> we couldn't get across the border. It's me and my mom and my sister. And um, earlier in the day, when we're talking about disaster preparedness, early in the day, we got robbed in Mexico. That we had backpacks that had like, you know, um, like our little bathing suits and towels and stuff like that, little snacks, that pack, that pack. So, you know, I were like, I'm going across the border. I'm going to have a good day. That was stolen. So mm. imagine all of your pre-planned, you got your water, you have your this, you know, all that type of stuff is gone. Mm. It's gone. So that was stolen. We went back to the place to see if, you know, we could figure it out. Of course, they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. We didn't see any backpack. So then we go to the border and realize now we can't get back home. So we have no supplies. We have nothing but the clothes on our back. And... There's no way to even like pay for, you know, pay to, to, to be safe. You know what I mean? My mom didn't have an extra, you know, four or $500 for us to go to a hotel or something like that for the night. So we end up sleeping at the bus station. And the only thing that I had was a Mexican blanket that I had ordered and that I had been walking around with there before. So, Nothing else, you know, it was only for, I want to say maybe 48 hours, but it felt like forever. It's the first time I had to sleep on the street. And the only thing I had was my blanket. That is my memento. That is the most important thing that I own. It's my Mexican blanket. So that, it, that, that experience created that for me. And Hopefully this experience, you know, quarantine, that type of thing, doesn't create that for you. It's something that you can choose out of, you know, um, out of excitement. Like, you know, go through some old pictures, like picture of me and my, that's the most important thing. That, you know, we were talking about um, this being a, a, not a sad conversation, that if you do things like this now, when it's not at the, you know, when it's not an emergency, then it feels different. And you also know, you know, you also know like, okay, so, what defines me is I like to color. So I'm going to bring my favorite pencil, my favorite coloring book. I don't care how heavy it is. It's going on my back because it's me. Because I need this because it's I a part this. of my humanity, of my psyche, of me leveling out, of me being connected to, because outside of that, I lose a piece of, I lose touch with, with that. oh my goodness. And it um, keeps you sane. And it's really important that we do it for our children. When they want to go out for the day, they want to bring a toy. It's the same thought process. Oh when you have a, gosh. when you're watching a friend's dog, like this is his blanket and this is his toy. There's that, we have to think about ourselves the same way, that we are the same, you know, we're the same. Nothing's changed, we've just grown up. But that same connection to who I am, what defines me, what makes Emily Tyner different from Rodney Burrs or, you know, Anita Baker? I don't know why I said her name, but I really do like her. Connor, right, right, right. I, was about to say, I was about to say some other stuff too. Right, that, that what makes you uniquely you. And when, for, you know, God forbid that you're in a line for food 
or you're in a shelter and everybody is just your patient number one, your mm. patient number, your attendee number, that you have something to hold on to, to remind you of who you of were who before are, this and who, who you you're going to be this. after. So, wow, right? Um, this happened to you at eight years old. They gave you this tip number seven. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, it's something that kept you grounded and it kept you since the time of eight to this to this time now. Um, you said something that I that took me took me away. It took me aback. Um, and you guys may have heard it when she said it. You said that you know, mom didn't have the money for the hotel, so we went to the bus station. I had my blanket. It was the first time I slept on the street. You guys, um, what I didn't get to say when we opened is that uh, I've known Emily for some time. She is a consummate professional. She has done really well in a different, a few different industries up in New York, one of the biggest cities in the world. Um, she has thrived. She's done some, some, some national stuff, kind of living in New York and traveling around different parts of the country. Uh, she's been involved in a few different initiatives. She's helped out some elected officials. Like she's done some things in her career. And I want to say, Emily, that this is the first time that I knew, learned so many of these things. I had no idea that you've been robbed at eight years old in, in, in the type of uh, etching that that does in a person's soul and in, in their mind, you know, and you kind of grow up with that. The world can also be a place where me and my mom and my sister, and I don't know who else was with you guys, can experience that. that that's, that's significant. The fact that it, you stepped on the street more than once, but whatever, maybe the second time was like a dare in high school. I don't know, <laughs> maybe it wasn't. Um, but you didn't just share with us seven tips. That was the last tip, you guys. And so if you gotta get out of here, because I know we talked for a long time, feel free to run. Uh, but I just wanted to say, Emily, um, you didn't share just now top 10 things from off some website, right? You, no. And you didn't even just share pass me down, hand me downs from mom or from grandma that is still more connected than some website sterile off somewhere. It's still connected to your family and to your lineage. But you literally shared things that came out of lived experience and, and the type of soul that's connected to that. I can't express to you the value. I had no idea that this is what you would be sharing. I didn't know that this would be the transparency uh, and the vulnerability that you would be bringing to the table. Um, I can only imagine the eight year old you. Mm -hmm only having a blanket from it not even a blanket that you left the house with no no i can't even imagine that um and so uh you came here and if i can use this word uh with with the proper amount of humility and honor you kind of bared yourself you kind of got in a sense emotionally soulfully naked before us and you didn't have to do that so i'm honored about that uh, uh, I'm kind of uh, it, 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 I feel like somebody put a lot of precious something in our my hands right now like it just put it in and I I want to properly I, I just respect the fact that this is that, that is valuable. You didn't you didn't just come up here and just run through. Here are the seven tips, Rodney. Hope they work. Good luck, right? You like you didn't right. do that. You really availed yourself. So thank you for that transparency. Thank you for that vulnerability. Um, and yeah, I don't even remember Emily the conversation we were having that prompted you and I offline to even touch this subject like I don't even know what the heck we were talking about maybe this coronavirus more than likely but it was in that conversation <laughs> that you started talking and I was like would you would you just say I missed what I, you said I remember well so what were we talking about what we were heck? talking about um I was talking about driving down from New York to Baltimore and I said that when I drove down here I had supplies for 10 days in my rental car you and you were like, what? You That's a four-hour drive. That's a four-hour drive that you do probably two times a month. 
Why but you got 10 days worth of supplies? Why do you have 10 days worth of supplies? Because they can close the border. There could be some overturned truck. Ooh. There could be, you know, there could be a million different things. But oh. what I need and part of my pre-plan was to make sure that my mom's not worried about me and I'm securing myself to know that it doesn't matter. There's no fear when you're prepared. There's, I'm not afraid of, there's nothing that can, there's nothing that can completely throw me for a loop, you know, otherwise some, some, you know, really aggressive violence. But at that, you know, then there's nothing but you and your, your maker at that point. Mm. So everything that you can do in your power, you should be doing. I have one other thing I want to say. And I have one question, and then I guess we can get on out of here. But yes, Neff, please jump in. The last thing I wanted to say was that natural disasters are the great equalizer. And by that, I mean that it doesn't choose who it's going to affect mm -hmm. or how it's going to affect from the upper class down to the, you know, they call them lower class, working professionals, working class, um, underclass, underserved, mm. whatever, that they're and a rich person that's not prepared is having a much harder time than somebody who, you know, scraped together their change and made sure that they have what it is that they need. And that experience transformed what what I think um, what I think my my mom and my dad and you know those people what they thought was necessary in life, having those type of experience, what is necessary in life. So in Belize, my family um, in, in those days were considered upper class. They were wow. government. Um, so they were, they had, they were the haves. They were the haves. At the end of the hurricane, my mother told me a story about going to sleep in a tire in the back of a stranger's truck. In a tire, in a tire, oh. mm -hmm. in like a in like a like spare an old tire? Time tire, like a spare tire, that curling up and going to sleep on the four and a half hour drive from the city to the northern district that wasn't affected by Hurricane Hattie, that she crawled into a tire and went to bed after living in, you know, living downtown, oh, having a beautiful God. house. Man, having please. you know nice clothes you know all those yeah, type of things yeah. and then having it all change in a snap oh my gosh oh my goodness your status doesn't mean anything when you literally have no place to go to exactly it Don't means nothing food. the only thing the wealth at that point and that's another thing oh i should have said that before that your wealth at that point are your supplies because if they rich and they have nothing and you have water, guess what you can, guess what you can trade for something else? Guess what you can, you know, you have fresh water that you can trade, that maybe you have some excess food that you can trade, or also just helping somebody out. If you're over-prepared and somebody's unprepared, now you can do the two fish and loaves of bread because you are now thinking outside of yourself. Oh my gosh. Oh man, can I say, can I say it one more time? I wasn't prepared <laughs> for the real of this of this conversation, man. I I thought we would come on here, high five, share some good quick tips, a word of the day. <laughs> and you just said your mom had to sleep in the back of a stranger's tire, uh, in the in the back of a truck curled up in a spare tire. Like it. it all right. I don't know how y'all feel. This is how I feel. Woo! That's how I feel. Like, woo! I still gotta use the bathroom. I still need some water. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so um, Emily, I have one uh, question for you guys, and this is a bonus for everybody that was able to stay through the end. Um, I remember when we first talked about doing the this online version. I paused that conversation. I was like, ah, don't tell me no more. Let's do it and share it with everybody. Everything that you guys are hearing has been my first time hearing it. She started talking about it. I paused it because I wanted it to feel as real. I wanted all of this stuff to hit me as it did. I had no idea it would feel like this. Oh my goodness. But um, so this was a very real exchange that you just witnessed. And something, Emily, that you don't know that was in my thoughts to, to ask you was 
um, as a woman, and I didn't know that all of this came down through so many women. I just know that you got it from your mom. So as a woman, you have a sister. Um, a lot of the people that may take this in may be ladies, right? There's probably going to be some dudes, hopefully. Uh, hopefully as many people get this and share it as possible. Right. For the women who choose to partake in our conversation and share it, sometimes prepping, when you see on TV, or like I said, the dude that told me about it, he's a military guy. And so sometimes the idea of prepping doesn't seem like, forgive me, I'm gonna make an assumption here, something as a lady, I do, I can't. I'm not physically strong to throw something on my back. I don't have access to all of this stuff. Where the heck do I get a glow stick from? And you know, all of those kind of things. And so sometimes what could happen is if I feel overwhelmed by solving a problem, I just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Right. I just, I just, I'm not even going to think about it because I can't solve it. And sometimes that's a very helpful mechanism. And sometimes it could be hurtful because it just sets us up for something that's inevitably coming. Right. Mm -hmm. As a, as a lady, as a woman, could you please speak to your fellow sisters across the world, across the diaspora, whatever, um, to let them know that even in them being themselves and the power and the strength of, of them, that how they can apply or, or, or do any of the things you talk about? Could you just kind of speak to the sisterhood a little bit? Absolutely. Um, well, I, I can answer that question from a lot of different angles that um, the first experience, my great grandmother, um, she had 15 kids with one man, was married the entire time. Her husband died before, mm. died before this, a few years before this. So there was nobody else to rely on besides herself. So, um, you have to be realistic in knowing who you have to rely on. And if the person that you have to rely on is mainly yourself, hopefully you have a support system that that can be anybody that, um, you, you take it piece by piece, because what we are good at is, um, working through issues, uh, you know, you know, taking them apart, like, okay, so this is going to be a next step, you know, break it down into steps, but also the women out there who are with a man who have a partner, not even necessarily with a man, but with a partner, mm -hmm. um, that it's your responsibility. Um, and I'm going to speak very plainly that it's your responsibility to make sure that you're being a good partner mm -hmm. and being a good partner means to take some of the stress off of your partner in the disaster preparedness. And that could mean a lot of different things because, you know, um, I don't like shopping, you know, I don't like online shopping. I don't wanna do, you know, I don't wanna do any of those things. So make the list then. If you don't like the shopping, make the list and then have, you know, have your partner do it. Or you do like the shopping, then, um, you know, then, then, um, your responsibility is to make sure that whatever your partner is bringing to the table and the and you know whether that is making sure that they're eating properly so that they are physically strong enough to carry you and your children away from a disaster then that's your responsibility you know that you're thinking about nutrition when you're making this list that you're thinking about the nutritional needs of everybody who's going to be you know who's going to be traveling with you pets you know, family members, all of those types of things that, you know, women, I think we, we tend to underestimate our power mm -hmm. and also what the power of responsibility um, that we create life, mm. like underscore, whether you're a woman that has a child, I don't have any kids, but whether you're a woman that has a child or not, that your form creates life absolutely that's what it does and bringing life to a situation that seems bleak and dark like a natural disaster is it's wow. who we are it's what the universe has you know has already wow. created in our hands so all you have to do is find out what your place is going to be whether you are physically strong whether you're mentally strong whether you're super organized whether you're not organized at all, but you're 
making sure that, you know, Hoover, you're around, you're keeping things light, you're making it jovial, you know what I mean? You're the one who's, you've done nothing, pack the bag, you've ordered nothing, you created nothing, he shouldn't have to pack the bag, she shouldn't have to pack the bag, they, should, they shouldn't have to pack the bag, that's what you should be doing, that's what you can bring to the table. And if you think about what your small piece can be, then you are honoring the women that have come before you the mm. the my you know my great grandmother my grandmother and stuff like that when i'm filling my car making sure that they don't have to worry about me needing gas cash food all that that's how i honor them and if you think about it like that then it's a lot less stressful and fearful like i'm doing this to honor i'm doing this to praise the ancestors um i'm thoroughly drained i started <laughs> this i started this conversation bright and, and, and perky and I must admit that going through the mental emotional exercises of this was adequately if I may use the word taxing it was yeah. adequately uh, draining um, and it carried I think the proper amount of reality check to it you know um, I love what you just ended with Emily about um, my portion it, it, and, and i know that people are different right and i'm not trying to put anybody in some big box but I, I i honor what you just said and i value it emily you said that our form i'm speaking as a woman <laughs> our, our form brings life to a situation whether that life is some little kid right or if that is a life that we can all feel that ha that's intangible but it, it, it brightens up a dream. Because when I, I can tell you this, I've, I've had this conversation about prepping with my homeboy from the military. Mm -hmm. And it felt like straight pressure and do this. It, there was no life. It was like do or die, right? <laughs> Yours had story. It had soul. It had memory. It had feeling. And it brought life to something that could have been a very dry and sterile list. Of, of things to check off. So even in that regard, right, I got to witness what you ended with, that life bringing aspect that, that seems, you know, we refer to our planet as mother earth mm -hmm. and even the earth bring, brings forth life. It has a life giving aspect to it. That's very different than a rock or very different than some of the other things that, that seem to, in our lingo, lingo or in our culture, even across cultures, seem to have more um, masculine qualities. And I'm not trying to gender anybody, but there are things that seem to be more masculine regardless of what my sex may be. Right, right. Things that are more feminine and, and nurturing. Um, and I'm a dad and I've considered myself to be a pretty good nurturer, but I can't bring life the way the earth does, right? And so I value that, I honor it in the, in the, in the wonderful um, component that it is. And so thank you so much for availing your time. Thank you for availing your story. Uh, I, I swear this, this, this needs to be made to a movie, y'all. Somebody <laughs> get in touch with Emily you know, and, and, get, and get the script together, man. And, and um, wow, I don't have words, so I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna say thank you. And uh, I appreciate your time, Emily. Thank you. Thank for you for having me. I love sharing my story, and hopefully, it touches somebody and helps them feel prepared. Absolutely. See you guys.